Apparently there is something called book tubing and <laughs> I guess I take take part in it to an extent. I don't know if there was anything like book tubing in uh, medieval England, but if there was, in 597, the um, year that St. Columba reposed, uh, when uh, Gregory the Bishop of Rome sent his buddy Augustine to, um, to England to see if there were any more of those cute blondes to um, convert to Christianity. The islands would have been all a buzz, all a twitter, because there was a new book on the island. Whether that book, uh, which we call the Gospels of St. Augustine these days, in which it was called from at least a couple of hundred years after its arrival in England, uh, whether Augustine carried in his hand luggage or whether it came with it later in a sort of papal post, is unknown, but um, it survives today in the Parker Library in Cambridge, and you may have seen it because it was used at the coronation of uh, King Charles. And um, it has also been used in the um, Consecration of, I think, the last seven Archbishops of Canterbury. One of the things I find kind of fascinating is that Christopher de Hamel, in whose book Meetings with Remarkable Manuscripts, I met this manuscript, uh, carried in the procession uh, for the consecration of both Rowan Williams and uh, what's his name, who's there now. And he said that when they were singing uh, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise for the consecration of Rowan Williams, uh, the pages just fluttered as if they were singing as well. But he said the pages did not flutter at the consecration of Justin Welby. Now, this, of course, was a Latin gospel book, because that's what people read in those days. <laughs> and uh, it was not, as one might have expected, Jerome's translation, the Vulgate. The Vulgate kind of got a slow start. The old Latin translations were pretty popular, especially for the Psalms. And the gospel book that Gregory sent to England to... Um, to give the gospel, to give the good news to the the people in at least uh, Kent, uh, was his own corrected Vulgate. He had gone through and and had and, and apparently there were a number of copies made like this. I mean, when you're the Pope, you can do things like that. Uh, a number of gospels that Gregory commissioned that were basically the Vulgate, but corrected with his preferred readings from the old Latin. Here is that uh, that uh, gospel book being shown to then Pope, um, the, the then Pope Benedict. Here is our buddy Christopher de Hamel, whose book is an absolutely charming thing if you are interested in in the old manuscripts, and they then Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams. Now, in a, oh, about another <clears throat> another hundred years or so, uh, there would emerge in England, in northern England this time, another book. Benedict Biscoff went to Rome in... Uh, Oh, about 670, I believe it was. And he had brought back to England with him the seventh Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Theodore of Tarsus, 
and he brought with them, them they brought with them what the bead called an immeasurable quantity of books of all kinds. And Benedict Best would set up a new a new monastic house at Warmouth, which would have a twin at Jarrow, and Bede would be a monk there and record all these things. And he uh, went back then again to Rome, that is, Benedict Biscop did, with a younger monk, monk, uh, Kilfrith, and they returned with an entire Bible, which is was very rare at those times. Let's see if we can show a picture of one. Yeah, see, it's a chunky monkey, as they say. Uh, but it was still uh, Benedict's preferred sort of mixed text. So Kilrith managed to have produced at Jarrow or Warmouth uh, three copies of the entire Bible corrected to the new uh, the new text of <laughs> New, only what, 400 years old at that time, of uh, Jerome. And of course, Jerome would remain the official text of the Roman Church for another, well, until until the Council of Trent, I suppose they another thousand years, not quite another thousand years. And Pius the Twelfth, 400 years later, would agree, 400, 16 to 19. Uh, 300 years later, agree that well the text could be translated from the original languages. Now, Kilrith made three copies of this whole Bible, and the only one that survives, and it's why uh, this is called the Codex Amiantinus, is at a monastery in Tuscany, Amiatus. It's not quite sure what he was doing with this copy. We have a documentation that he sailed away apparently to give this new Bible to the Pope and somewhere along the way he didn't make it to Rome. It's thought that he wanted to be made the new Archbishop of Canterbury or some important thing himself, maybe even Pope. Uh, the two copies that had been in Duro Pardon me, at Jarrow and Warmouth were lost, but this copy remains. Now, I was reminded as I read these early chapters in this charming book, which I completely recommend if you are interested in, in old books. Here is a table of contents so you can kind of see what, uh, what you might find there. I've been reading a chapter a night, kind of uh, taking it in, in doses because it's so charming. Um, so I've gotten as far as the Hours of Jean de Navarre. Uh, charming, charming book. But I was reminded as I was reading this book of uh, a Bible in my own life and thinking about it made me realize a number of things, one of which is just what a remarkable world we live in, a remarkable time when um, we think nothing of having books. One of the things that the Hamill points out in his book, uh, you'll have to pardon my voice, but the air is full of, um, oh, some kind of, some kind of tree sperm. Oh, excuse me. Uh, and I'm stopped up and sneezing. You'd think the trees would be more uh, modest. Anyway, you know, it was, it was the beginning of the 13th century before individuals began to have books in most of the world, in the European world, and it was only the very wealthy. And now, of course, all of us who want them have gazillions of books. I mean, even if we can't afford them, we can. <laughs> there are free piles all over town. 
I remember when the New English Bible came out in, was it 1962, the first, the New Testament came out? 1961. And I was a lad in the old country, and there were no booktubers in that day. But I saw it at the local bookstore, the only bookstore in town. And if I remember correctly, it cost $5. It was a lovely blue, blue volume. And it was quite remarkable. It was kind of ahead of its time in that it was laid out in single columns. Uh, and has, whoops, this is the Apocrypha. One of the nice things about this uh, edition, by the way, is it puts the intertestamental books, as they call them sometimes, between the Testaments, laid out in single columns. And I was not aware of textual criticism then, so, you know, the passage about the woman caught in adultery is, is sort of an appendix to the Gospel of John. It says, young woman, instead of virgin, in uh, Isaiah, you know, I don't know why these people aren't familiar with with uh, Jerome's quite sophisticated explanation of why he translated Alma, because Jerome kind of liked the Hebrew text, but he was convinced that that virgin was a good translation in that context. It has um, the longer uh, ending of of. Um, Mark's Gospel, for instance, stuck in the, I mean, you know, an ending will be at the end, but it has a little note explaining how not all manuscripts have this. But it was cost, it cost five dollars, and I couldn't afford it. I was impressed by it. I mean, gosh and God, look who recommended it. I don't know what I paid for this particular copy, but almost nothing. Um, and I, I, I like this kind of copy with a certain provenance, but see all these, all these, <coughs> all these big, biggie churches. <coughs> I hope my voice lasts to the end of this video. Sorry. Um, but I wanted to make it today because I think I'm going to be out of town next week, and who knows what I'll do. Seeing, you know, that seemed well recommended. Well, I remember when the paperback edition came out. And I think it costs a dollar and a quarter paperback edition of just the New Testament. And that seems like not much money, but at that time, of course, well, I don't know why I say, of course, you guys don't remember this most of you. You could get paperbacks at a rack at the, at the drugstore for 15 cents. So I, I got the paperback. And then it was hardly any years later that the Revised English Bible came out. And <laughs> I uh, actually bought this for a little bit more than, than $5 at the uh, local used bookstore. It had been sitting there languishing for six years that I know of, and I thought it just needed a home. And I thought it was fascinating, this blurb from Life Magazine. Remember Life Magazine? There's a great hunger for what these new translators set out to do. Retell the gospel in fresh current English, free but faithful to the oldest text, as accurate and clear in their speech as Matthew, Luke, and Paul were in their first century Greek. To read it is like reading the great story for the first time. Every century deserves to hear the greatest of all stories in its own speech. And this has been a magnificent failure <laughs> as a translation. It reads really delightfully. Uh, whether it's the most accurate depends on what one means by accurate. I think it's a little sad. I mean, this is actually not even the the full size the first edition. I didn't find it. I was looking for one cheap because I didn't. I, well, I wanted it cheap just because. I want to illustrate how inexpensive one can find these, but uh, the original edition was larger. The paper is thicker, the type is larger. Already the uh, folks who were in charge of producing this, this revision 
Yeah, here they are. Um, and particularly, I suppose, Oxford and Cambridge realized that the, there wasn't perhaps as great a demand as uh, Time magazine has suggested. Well, shocks. It's confusing, you know. <laughs> it uh, was one thing when a new translation came out every couple of hundred years and uh, you were writing them out by hand and you were the Pope and you could have all your favorite translations combined in one one volume. But, uh, you know, if, if one either is not a Christian and looking for the book that those weird Christians read, or if one is a Christian and wants to uh, wants to have a, a good translation, well, you know, do you get the uh, the Jerusalem Bible? Should have put it up here, which was oh a magnificent event in my life when I discovered it because I was a history major then. And the the uh, the notes in here are really helpful for for historical purposes, and I like the translation. It's not the most accurate, but it is very readable. But there is also a new a new English a, a new Jerusalem Bible, and of course, you know there are King James only folks, but there is also a new. King James Version, which uh, is part of the Orthodox basis for the Orthodox Study Bible. There is not yet an official, complete Orthodox English translation of the Bible, so this is kind of the most current, although most Orthodox folk, uh, I think, use the King James Version. One of the, one of the nice things I think about the, um, the English Standard Version is that although it is a revision of the Revised Standard Version, or a vision at least of the New Revised Standard Version. You can't tell that from the title page. You know, if you just, and this may be one of the reasons this translation is so popular. English Standard Version. How solid does that sound? Pretty solid. And, uh, so anyway, you know, I was just thinking about how having inexpensive books is, of course, delightful, but it can also be a bit confusing and even bewildering. I have piled up here one, two, three, four, five, six, six volumes of the Bible, and I can look uh, to my left, and there's another one, and a couple of New Testaments, and little bits and pieces. And I try not to have too many copies of the Bible around. Too many different translations of of uh, the Iliad or the like, because it gets confusing. Which one do I read? Which one do I know? But uh, we do live in that sort of world. And it's very easy to think that it's just better than it's ever been. And it very well may be that that is true. But it's also true that it is a pretty confusing time to live. I didn't start out to make this a video about confusion. I just meant to mention how, how accessible things are these days that were not accessible oh, to even to rich people before the 13th century. How, oh, you know, there are whole YouTube channels devoted to a new book every day, and I confess I'm a little tempted to do that myself. But after a while, there gets to be kind of an overload. I, I mentioned that I am, am rationing myself a chapter a night uh, from this book because you know I want it to last I want to have a little time to read Mark Chu a little bit Emily the Jest 
or that I'm reading. And when we have so much stuff to read, stuff with, you know, not only the, the scripture itself, but all sorts of notes to go along with it. I'm not, not interesting enough. I'm not, you know, opening this to notes, but believe me, they're here. Um, yeah. There we go. And and this is a delightful edition of the uh, New Jerusalem Bible. But you can skip through the whole thing just reading these little, little bits and pieces here. Or you can get distracted in the Jerusalem Bible by uh, the sort of chain references and and all the little historical bits and that's fascinating and not a bad thing to do I suppose or in the Orthodox study Bible you know you need to if you read it you'll you'll quickly be told that where these bits and pieces are fit into the liturgy of the church and that's good stuff to know and it is of course fascinating to be reminded that once upon a time you couldn't uh, couldn't order a book like this for, I don't know, less than $30. Um, but there is also, I think, a value in in just the text. Or as uh, they used to say uh, in that detective story, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. And not have such a wonderful wealth because... Well, too much of a good thing is too much, even if it is a good thing. Hmm. Well, I would, of course, be curious to see how you make your way through the forest of conflicting translations, whether of the Bible or the Iliad or, uh, oh, Dante's Inferno or anything else that you might like to read. And I think that I'd like to end this video with this psalm because it um, it kind of brings us back to what the point of all these books ought to be because we shouldn't be satisfied just with the books but what the books might show us. This is a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary beholding your power and glory because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So will I bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and unto ages of ages. Amen.